Hello, hello, and welcome again to this episode of I Got This. And as you know, I'm always talking about the universal I. This series of interviews that I've been doing have been around a book, uh, a collaborative book that I've written with 40 other authors called From Bottom to Top. And for those of you just tuning in for the first time to these episodes in this series, From Bottom to Top is about those moments, those times when we feel raw, when we feel naked, when we feel exposed because we just really don't know what to do. Um, Those times when we're questioning things, when we feel like we've missed things, when we have to take ownership of our lives and don't know how to quite do that. So for everyone, it's very different, you know, how they reach their bottom. But we've all made some choices to turn to turn things around and to move towards the top. So today I have with me a wonderful woman and she really is um, her topic and her chapter is really around the reason why I started from bottom to top in the first place. So before I introduce you, let me just give you a little bit about that. Ever since COVID started, I mean, suicide has been a big killer of teens to begin with, but Once COVID started, that kind of spread from teens. Teens numbers went up, but so did adult numbers. And we get into a space where we feel like we have no other choices. And the idea from bottom to top is to let you know that there are choices. There's always choices. There's always options. You just might not always see them. And um, it's about reaching out. So today I want to talk to you or speak or sorry, introduce you to Jackie Simmons. Hi, Jackie. How are you? Hi, I'm great. And it's wonderful to to be with you, Aisha. Um, It's just nice to see you and to be here and part of this show. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you for taking the time to be with us. So before I get into, you know, you're from bottom to top, I want to figure out and share with people like, where are you right now? What not, not physically. Where are you in your life right now? What are you doing? I know, I know you're doing some fantastic things, but what are you doing right now? Who are you? Who is Jackie Simmons right now? Jackie Simmons right now is the director of the Teen Suicide Prevention Society. I co-founded the society with my three daughters just around the time that COVID hit. Not because of COVID, but because of the rise in teen suicides, before COVID. So that's one aspect. The other side of me is I'm the creator of Somatic Intuitive Mastery. It's a certification program for coaches, consultants, healers to help permanently resolve negative emotional history for their clients. What I would call suicide proofing because it is our history that tends to trigger us into the places of this will never get better. So Those are the things that I'm doing under the Teen Suicide Prevention Society. We're training talk leaders. These are the people who go out and teach how to have the talk to stop suicidal thoughts before you think your loved one needs to have the talk. And so we're training the leaders in the Suicide Prevention Society, and I'm certifying the masters in my Success Journey Academy. And that's what I'm up to. That's amazing. And it's, it's, it's needed big time. It's, it's big time. It's required. Um, I was, you were on Ted talks and you did a great Ted talks. And I remember listening to that, not that it was so long ago, but I do remember listening to that. And there was a part that, you know, you, you, you hear it, but it doesn't hit home until you said it, like not where you, you came up and you said, you know, when one person commits suicide, how many people, and you actually had numbers of how many people are affected by that one life coming to an end? You know, the numbers vary depending on who you talk to. The standard understanding is that one person taking their own life immediately impacts 20 people in a significant way. When we're discussing teens and suicide, What I focus on is the suicide attempts and the impact of the suicide attempts. And 3,000 American teens were attempting to take their own lives every day before COVID. We don't even know what the numbers are now. Right. At the 3,000 a day number, that's 6,000 parents 
every day who start to live the guilt nightmare that I lived. And over 20,000 grandparents, aunts, uncles, brothers, and sisters. Not to mention day. friends. And, and oh gosh. When you add in friends, classmates, neighbors, teachers, boyfriends, and girlfriends, now you're at hundreds of thousands of people every day being brought into the guilt nightmare. Every day. And that's that's that is huge. Yeah. Well, that's why we started the society to try to get ahead of this. What we found was that the programs that are out there called suicide prevention, they're intervention programs. They kick in only when someone has a known risk factor. You know, they've got a mental health diagnosis. They have a previous attempt. That's when those programs kick in. I don't call that prevention. But I realized what happened is that they're asking the question, how do you stop suicide? We were asking the question, how do you stop suicidal thoughts from getting hooked and forming a negative echo chamber? Right. So we started with a different question, and that's how we ended up with the pure prevention programs that we have. It's incredible. It's incredible. I I know at one time I was doing some statisticals on teen suicides and and. And the one thing that I found was a great number of them were actually committing suicide in the room next to where their parents were watching television. They take their lives at the moment that they see no other option. You hit that right on the head. It is where this dying seems better than living. And usually it's not that they want to die. It's just that they don't see how to live. Yeah. It's unfortunate. It's unfortunate. Huh. So now, obviously, this was all triggered somehow. We're not going to get into your full chapter and what you wrote about, but how did you know when you'd hit bottom? How did you know? What were the danger signs in your life? The danger signs in my life for hitting bottom were, I would call it, if, if it was an infant, if I had been a baby, it would have been labeled as failure to thrive. I had a business. I've been an entrepreneur most of my adulthood. And my experience is like, I think a lot of other people's. I did everything I was told to do. I went to networking events. I gave out, you know, I I attended hundreds of networking events, gave out thousands of business cards, built up a ton of goodwill and had very few clients. I got by, but just. And that failure to thrive was an alert that something was wrong, but I didn't see it. I didn't right. get the memo, if you will. <laughs> it, it wasn't until this whole journey into the world of what's happening in the world with suicide that pulled the, the cover back on my own story with my own daughter that I've figured it out. But yeah, the warning signs for me were failure to thrive. A um, couple of bouts of clinical depression, a couple of failed marriages. There was not an area of my life where I was thriving in. Right. I was getting by. And a lot of people do that. They're just in that place of, and I'm not going to say getting by is the same as the word I'm about to use, but we exist. In some cases we're existing. We're not, we're not stepping into our, we're not, there's no fulfillment. There's no, they're not stepping into what we would call success for ourselves. So now you've reached that point. You decided to make a change. You made some decisions. How many, what did you feel like? What options did you feel were open to you? The power of hitting rock bottom is that you've got no place to go, but up. Right. And What came with that was that as soon as you turn around, as soon as you are willing to look in the direction other than down, opportunities show up. The options that showed up immediately for me was the opportunity to come out of what the problem was, which was the problem. I had a secret. I didn't want anyone to know that my daughter had been in so much mental and emotional pain that she thought dying was better than living. Right. Not just once, but many times. And that secret 
put a barrier between myself and other people. So the first option that came open for me was the option of telling that story. Right. So that was the first option I took. So I highly recommend it. If you've got something that you see as as something that is sabotaging you, something that is holding you down or bringing you down, write it out. You don't have to share it with anyone, but get it out of you and at least onto paper. And enough times that you might get the courage to sh- to actually share it with someone who could help you. I mean, I try I think about, you know, during COVID, how many women or people were stuck at home with somebody who was abusive, you know, that l- at least they got a break from them when they went to work or something. And, and, and now they didn't have that break or how many people have been in a really abusive situation. And now it was just worse, you know, and if you feel like you, if you've got a secret, then something's wrong. In this world, if there is a secret that big that you can't tell anyone, then that's your biggest sign, I think, that something is is very wrong. We tell ourselves the story of it's not that bad. I can handle it. You know, when it comes to abuse, the line that we hear is they didn't mean it. It's the lies that we tell ourselves about it. And when we buy into those, I can say we're living in our comfort zone. Our comfort zone is that place that's, just enough that we're not hungry and it's just good enough that we're not hungry and just bad enough that we're not happy. And that's where most lives get lived. It's right next door to comfort zone is right next door to should. (laughs) And, And I also think we, like, I think with some people we, we, I know I did, you create a tolerance level. I almost call it like a callus, you know, Mm -hmm. um, a tolerance level of, what you think is acceptable. Well, they said it, the more they do, and they put out these wonderful studies, which are really awful because the study is that we only allow people to abuse us to the level that we abuse ourselves. Absolutely. Yeah. And when we start healing that hurt, when we start healing ourselves, we stop tolerating so much. And the problem in a relationship that has an abusive side to it is that our partners don't want us to change. They're going to send really strong change back messages. Oh, by the way, this is true in a positive relationship too. Absolutely. One person changes, everybody around them says change back because it's not comfortable for us if you change. (laughs) Yeah. So it's not just about abuse. It's just this is how relationships work. When one person changes, everybody is now uncomfortable because the what they were used to doesn't exist anymore. Right. So they tell you to change back. They just are trying to stay comfortable. Yeah, true enough. True enough. So when somebody reads your chapter, I mean, it's going to be pretty obvious the question I'm going to ask right now. But when somebody reads your chapter, what is the takeaway that you want them to 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 get out of it? What is the biggest takeaway? What is the biggest message you hope that they get? The biggest message is that we're at war. War with two A's. W-A-A-R. We're all at risk. And because of the massive surge of negative images that we are being bombarded with, we are all more at risk every day. And if you know someone who's tried or died, you're in a higher risk group. And thanks to media, we all know someone. We all know a gifted comedian, a talented singer, or a celebrity chef. So we're all at risk. If that would be my first takeaway. And the second one is mitigating that risk is easy. You can build a buffer between you and the edge very simply. Yes. Change your choices. Change your outlook. Get help. Reach out. Tell someone, (laughs) don't suffer in silence. You don't need to. And you don't have to wait till you're suffering to build the buffer. Pure prevention is not waiting until you're in trouble. If you are in trouble, dial 911, dial 988, find your local 800 number for a suicide intervention line. Don't wait, get help. Absolutely. If you're not at risk, You know, life is pretty good. You're schlepping along. Go ahead and start doing the things that will prevent you from ever becoming at risk. That's my message. Don't wait. Start now. 
So other than that, do you have a favorite strategy, a favorite tip, a favorite something that you like to share with people? Maybe a quote? Uh, favorite strategy, tip, maybe a quote. Well, I've got the world's longest quote because it's leaving Shouldville. <laughs> <laughs> so it's got four pieces into it. The first one is just my favorite quote. You can't do it wrong. You've never done it wrong and you can't do it wrong. So just start from where you are and move in the direction you want to go. Right. Absolutely. You know, there is no wrong. There is no wrong. There's no failure, only feedback, you know? Right. You may have things that you do not prefer, but the minute you label them as wrong, you add more energy to them than they deserve and it actually tethers you to them. Right. So it's just, hmm, I don't prefer that outcome. What can I do to change it? Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you so much for being with us today, Jackie, and sharing your insight and sharing your chapter with From Bottom to Top. Um, It's always a pleasure to chat with you. There's always a piece. There's always something where you're going, yeah, ah, there's another aha moment. Yep, yep, yep. There it is. So wonderful to speak to you. Wonderful to have you all listening today. And please come on back for the other episodes of I got this. Thanks so much. Have a fantastic day. You are blessed.